All right, then I guess we'll get started. Um, so uh, my name is Eric Evans. I'm a member of the Cassandra PMC. Uh, been with the project since about the time it entered the, the incubator. Uh, working for Rackspace at the time. And I work for a company called uh, the Open NMS Group now. Um, before I get started, I'm going to try to correct uh, an ongoing uh, problem I have. It's happened, it's happened even here at Buzzwords, where I'll be talking about Open NMS for a while. I'll be well into a conversation. And someone will say, uh, what did you say? What did you say the name was? Is it? Uh, so if you heard, if, if, if you weren't able to hear the acronym, I know this is all my fault. I, I don't enunciate it well enough. I, I say it too fast. So um, if you're thinking, did he say, sorry, my thing's not working here. If you're thinking, did he say open M&Ms? Uh, no. But I like this idea, so if anybody wants to work on this, uh, let me know. If you're thinking, did he say open enemas? <laughs> no, I did not. Uh, and if you want to work on this, leave me out of it. I, I, I want no part of, the, no part of this. No, it's uh, NMS for Network Management System. Uh, which is convenient because it is, in fact, a system for managing networks. So uh, what this means is uh, discovery of your network, what devices are running on it, uh, what kind of devices they are. Is it a Cisco switch or a, a Linux host running 3.12? What are the capabilities? What services? Uh, what agents are running on it? Um, what's the topology of the network? How are things interconnected? What's the, the critical path between devices? Uh, and then it, you know, it'll use this information to sort of self-configure, to provision the nodes, and then you get kind of a, an asset database in the process. Um, service monitoring is everything uh, from, a, from something as simple as ICMP of an IP interface up to you know, rather sophisticated synthetic transactions, uh, clicking through a web page and validating the result. Um, we do data collection. So this is our time series use case. This is basically what the rest of the talk will be about. Um, this is the collection, the storage of, uh, of time series data, trending values over time, uh, thresholding, making graphs, uh, things like that. And we do event management, so the reception of external events, generating events for service failures, threshold failures, um, deduplication, correlation of events, and, and turning those into notifications. Uh, OpenNMS is a, is a rather old project, a mature project. It's been around for about 15 years in uh, the dog years of the internet and software. That's, that's quite a long time. It's also, uh, it is written in Java and it's uh, free software, open source software. Uh, for time series data, we currently use RRD tool. RRD stands for Round Robin Database. Um, round RRD tool is, is also a, a very very mature project, also been around for about 15 years. Very ubiquitous, used in a lot of well-known tools. Um, it's ostensibly a, a solution for time series data. Uh, one that's file-based and that you, you get this sort of automatic incremental aggregation. So the way this works is you create an RRD and in doing so define all of the metrics that, will, that should be stored within it and the aggregations that correspond to those metrics. So uh, five minute averages for, you know, if you, if you want to store 30 days of those or one hour averages over the course of a year. And in doing so, all of the space that, that it'll ever need is allocated and uh, each time you update an RRD with a metric, you're incorporating that, that new value into each of the aggregations and um, when they get so old that, that uh, they exceed the number you've, you've allocated, they just fall off the end. Um, and it does graphing. In fact, this is actually what it does. That's why I said ostensibly time series. Um, it's really all about graphing, and everything else is a means to this end. This is why it does aggregations. Uh, actually, it's, it's why you only get aggregations. The raw data is not available. Um, if you think of the problem of, of drawing a graph, you've got a, a canvas of some finite size, say 400 pixels in width, and uh, you want to plot uh, data that's, let's say, sampled at five-minute intervals, and you want to draw the last six months, you clearly, clearly have more 
data points than you have pixels to draw them in. So you need to aggregate that down. You also want the, the points along the x-axis to be evenly distributed and aligned on a common time boundary. And, uh, and all of this normalization is what these aggregations are for. They're meant to be plugged directly into the graph. And it's kind of cool having an all-in-one solution for you know, storing the data and getting a graph, uh, but there is an ugly downside to it, and that is the, the I.O. involved. This is a read, modify, write. So uh, each update of an RD involves reading and writing file-based metadata and you know, per metric metadata, and of course the, the actual values themselves. And so kind of at a minimum, you get five IOPS just to update a single metric. So if you have uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of metrics, uh, then that's going to be thousands or tens of thousands of IOPS, even at you know, a rather long uh, sample interval of, of, say, five minutes. Um, to put that into perspective, even a really nice high-end rotational hard drive is only good for about 200 I IOPS. Uh, it's tempting to say, well, that's, that's certainly within range of an SSD, uh, but since you get a finite number of of deletes or overwrites in an SSD, and since each one of these updates constitutes a new write, um, you, you'll actually, you know, the longevity of an SSD is, is really poor under this kind of workload. It's a very high volume, uh, and you sort of run through the lifespan of the drive rather quickly. Um, DRAM-based SSDs are a really good fit, but they're also very expensive. And that's kind of what this slide is meant to show, that uh, we're kind of at the end of the runway in terms of vertical scalability. Um, as engineers, we, you know, we, we, we try to make everything as optimal as possible, and so the idea of just simply throwing more hardware resources at it is kind of uh, unpalatable, but uh, vertical scaling is actually a great way to go. If you, it's usually the cheapest thing you can do, but only so long as your avail the availability of inexpensive commodity hardware outstrips your, actu your actual needs, and we're, uh, we're, we're clearly at past that point or, or getting there. So in other words, we're sort of drinking from the proverbial fire hose. We have uh, more data than we can easily write out. Uh, this is kind of a bad problem for us. This is supposed to be in our wheelhouse. This is something that, you know, it's kind of a you know, core functionality. Uh, networks are getting bigger, um, more complex, more devices, so more metrics to collect. The Internet of Things is upon us and threatens to bring, you know, just an explosion in the number of devices, and, uh, and, and we don't really have a good enough write throughput as it is. It's also interesting, maybe, maybe ironic, that the source of the high I.O. Is, is aggregations. The aggregations exist explicitly for the purpose of, of graphing, and yet we graph a very, very small amount of the data we collect. Um, it probably doesn't seem like that to our users, uh, but you know, the average knock, if it has you know, 10, 15, 20 people, that's probably a pretty good-sized team working on any given shift. You know, maybe they have a wall board projected up with you know, graphs of all their WAN links, you know, half a dozen, let's say. Uh, you know, they may be periodically looking at graphs of an hour's worth of data, or the you know, last hours, the last day's worth of data, you know, throughout the day to troubleshoot issues. But I mean, how many graphs could, could somebody actually look at within a given day, you know, meaningfully? Uh, you know, for millions of metrics, what actually ends up getting read is just a very small fraction of the data. So this is a really poor trade-off to be, to be aggregating everything. It's like we're optimizing to read every single solitary second of every minute of every metric we have at least once, uh, and almost the exact opposite is true. There are other problems with RD for us as well. Um, not everything is a graph, and so you know, trying to perform other forms of analytics on data that's spread out through the file system using APIs that are really designed for graphing, uh, and the data is already aggregated, so there's a loss of resolution. Uh, that's not ideal. RD is a little bit inflexible. In order for us to, to first store data, we would have had to have known about it ahead of time, uh, created an RD to put it in, and then once you do that, you can't really change them after the fact. We have a variety of problems that have proven uh, intractable to solve. Incremental backups is kind of a classic example. It is file-based so you can simply back up the file system. Uh, but due to the way the bytes are laid out on, on the disk, there's no easy way to get at just what's changed. Um, and then, perhaps most importantly, um, you know, we're a network management system. So if there's a problem with the network, we're expected to be available in order to, to notify operations. Uh, if there's a problem, we're expected to be available so that we can be used to troubleshoot and mitigate the problem. Uh, but we are in 
in fact, dependent upon the network. And so saying that we, you know, we rely on the file system is a fancy way of saying that we have a single point of failure. Uh, and so that's not at all ideal. Uh, one takeaway I get from RRD, or at least I think it's RRD that kind of pointed me at this, is that uh, we access metrics in groups. RRD encourages this, that you put similar or related metrics that you intend to, to access together within a single RRD. And that is, that is what we do. That is the natural way of modeling uh, this type of data. Uh, if you think of, of graphing, uh, how likely are you to graph incoming bytes from a network interface without also plotting outgoing on the same graph? Or uh, cores on a CPU or, or one five and 15 minute load averages, you're usually going to do these things together. In fact, most of these visualizations are interesting when they let you correlate multiple data points on a single, a single graph. So we naturally uh, collect things in groups. And I think that's, that's a, an important feature. So given all of this, what, does, what are OpenNMS's requirements? What, what do we need in, in the way of a time series storage? Well, we don't have enough throughput, so we need something that's higher throughput. We need better availability. I put late aggregation up here. Um, we need to be smarter about aggregation, smarter about expending those resources. Uh, the cost value benefit needs to be better. And most importantly, it needs to be decoupled from, from storage. We need to be able to store regardless of whether we have the capacity to, to aggregate those. Um, and then we need to take advantage of this grouped storage and retrieval. You know, we access metrics, we even collect them and store them at the same time. So uh, whatever we use should, should make that easy. Um, and most storage mechanisms are probably going to have a way of optimizing for this and, and making it more efficient. Uh, so from the, the title of the talk, it's probably no mystery that our solution to this involves Cassandra. Uh, for those of you not familiar, Cassandra is an Apache top-level project for a distributed database, one that is well known to be highly available and have high throughput. Um, and it's also known as a solution that utilizes this tunable consistency. You may have heard eventual consistency, uh, talking about the same thing. Eventual consistency has kind of a negative connotation to it. Um, and this is, this is not a, a negative or downside. I, I would argue this is, this is an important feature and hopefully I, I can uh, demonstrate that. So uh, let me regale you with the reasons why I think Cassandra is a really good fit for time series data and, and for open NMS. So first looking within a given node and the right path for a single node, uh, you'll remember I said that uh, even a nice high-end rotational hard drive is only good for a couple hundred IOPS. Uh, this, is, this is caused by the fact that they're mechanical, and uh, to, you know, to, to start a new operation, a read or write, you first must position the head and there's rotational latency. How long does it take to move the platter at least 180 degrees? As all this is mechanical, it all works at fixed speeds and so you can only do so many of those in a given period of time. But once you start an operation, once you position the head and you're ready to go, they can move a tremendous amount of data. So what Cassandra tries to do is optimize for that sequential disk access. Uh, and the way it does that is with a log structured write path. So the client starts by writing the data into a, an in-memory structure. The client write lands in an in-memory structure that's maintained in sorted order. Um, and it's also written to a commit log. The commit log is simply crash recovery. It's just to replay back into the mem table if there's an unexpected outage. Uh, so we don't read from that, and thus it's append only. That's what that keeps the disk access sequential. When a threshold is reached, the mem table is flushed to disk to create an SS table and they're never updated in place. Uh, a new one is created each time, so those are sequential as well. And what this means is that we're optimized for write throughput, which is exactly what we need. Uh, and the fact that it's sorted on disk makes it a really great fit for time series because you know, we, we sample things and store them by time. Time is obviously sorted. Um, when we retrieve this data, we expect to start with you know, some time in the past and, and uh, you know, take a range of data up to some time, either less in the past or the present, and we expect to get it back in, in, in ascending order, and that's exactly the way it's persisted. Um, pulling back out of a single node and looking at the cluster as a whole, uh, obviously if we want to distribute this data, we need a way of partitioning the cluster so that we can uh, assign the data to the nodes within it. So the way we usually visualize this 
if you imagine a namespace and covering, you know, encompassing all possible primary keys, and you mapped it on to sort of a ring or clock face in ascending order, sort of sorted in ascending order, working clockwise around the ring, lowest value at 12, and then uh, wrapping around to the highest value at 12, uh, then you could position the nodes within, within this, this namespace, and a partition simply becomes the interval between where a node resides on the ring and, and the preceding node. So when you want to know where something goes, you just find its sort order and put it on that node. Uh, additional copies, you just use something that's, that's, that's uh, deterministic based on the first location. Once they're all positioned, they're all identical. None of them are special. This is just the algorithm for placement. Once we have multiple copies of the data, then we have to deal with this reality, which you may have heard uh, you know, either here at Buzzwords or, or perhaps at another conference, the CAP theorem. Uh, these are all desirable properties. We want consistency, we want availability, and we want partition tolerance, but the cap, theory, cap theorem tells us we can have at most two of these at any given, at any given time. It's really pretty intuitive. If, if you were to, to write a value to two hosts, if, if you were going to synchronously replicate a value of any value to, to any two hosts, uh, and by synchronous I mean you're going to write it to both of them and it's successful once it's been written to both of them, then it follows that that value is consistent. You know, you've, you've explicitly made sure that it was. But if one of those nodes is down, you, you can't do that. You can't write it to both of them because one of them's unavailable. You've traded availability in favor of consistency. And likewise, for an asynchronous replication, uh, you may get that availability, but you lose the consistency because you can't reason about the data after disconnecting from one host. That's all this really means. It's just a way of describing the contentious properties of distributed storage. So how does Cassandra uh, deal with this? Well, it's, it's actually quite simple. Rather than making it an all or nothing proposition, we either synchronously replicate and consider all of the copies on a read or we asynchronously. Uh, it's tunable, how many of the replicas are, are synchronous versus asynchronous, and it's on a per operation basis. So imagine a replication factor of three and Cassandra's most uh, utility of consistency levels is quorum, which is simply majority. So if we have three copies and we write a quorum, we'll synchronously replicate to two. That's what will constitute a successful write. If we also read a quorum, then we're, we're going to consider two copies. We're going to need to retrieve two copies in order to consider that a valid read. And if we do that, there's no way we won't overlap and get at least one of the, one of the most recent writes, assuming that there was any inconsistency to begin with. And so long as the number of copies we synchronously replicate to and that we consider on a read is more than the replica count, we'll always have read or write consistency. You'll always read the last most up-to-date value you wrote. What's great about that is that both the read and the write in this scenario could survive a single node failure in the replica group and everything continues on as normal. There's the possibility of inconsistency within the cluster, but who cares, you're still reading what you wrote and those values will get fixed eventually. So, the properties of distribution are that it's symmetrical. Given the way that algorithm works, uh, there's no need for coordination. All you need to know is all of the nodes in the, in the, in the cluster, uh, which is easy, and placement can be done by anybody. Everyone follows the same rules. Uh, that makes it very operationally simple um, to have all of the nodes to be uh, identical. It also means it's linearly scalable, so you, know, you can literally double the size of the cluster, you know, go from five nodes to 10, and you'll get uh, you know, twice the throughput, twice the capacity. It's redundant because there's stores, we store multiple copies, so if one fails, one machine fails in a replica group, we don't lose any data. And it's highly available because we can game those multiple copies, those replicas, to trade away a little consistency uh, in, in favor of availability and still get consistency at the end. Uh, so all in all, I think it's a really, really good fit for time series. So, what does a data model look like for time series, time series data? Again, given the requirement for grouped storage. So let's start with the resource. A resource, is, I guess, in this case, is kind of an abstract concept. The resource will be that instance that, that, we, that we associate our metrics with or our group of metrics. So a resource here could be a host or an application, or more importantly, since it's a group, it might be an Ethernet interface on a host. Uh, if the group is meant to be statistics for the Ethernet interface, or it could be 
a processor on that host if it's meant to be, the group is meant to rep represent processor statistics. So we're gonna want, uh, well first let's look at this in abstract terms. We're gonna want a one-to-many relationship between this resource and the sample times. But we're also going to want a one-to-many relationship between the sample times and the metrics that we want to store at that time. So if we were modeling this in a relational database, this is probably something we would do with a couple of join tables. Uh, joins are not possible in Cassandra, but we do have this nifty support for uh, uh, wide rows in, in CQL. So this would be the DDL for a, a, perhaps an oversimplified version of what I'm talking about. Uh, Let's let T, M, and V be the, the timestamp, the metric name, and the value, respectively. And of course, the resource is that resource string. All of the, the magic in this happens in the primary key definition for what's, with what's in the parentheses. So resource first, that means it's the partition key. It's the one that determines placement within the cluster, if you remember the diagram of the ring. Um, and then the, the, the next columns in order will be the timestamp column and the metric column. And what this does is it causes a grouping of the columns in the underlying storage such that we can, we can create this one-to-many mapping first between the resource and timestamps and then timestamps and metrics. Since the value doesn't, doesn't appear in that, we'll have exactly one value for every resource, timestamp, and metric combination. Um, so this is my uh, attempt at visualizing this. Um, I don't know how well this is going to work. It's the first time I tried it like this. This is, I will stress, uh, what I'm trying to convey is the, uh, what happens in the underlying storage, right? So this is not what Cassandra presents you. But in the underlying storage, um, everything that is identified by a primary key, our resource here, is going, to, is going to be essentially a collection of sorted columns. And so that primary key definition, what it does is it, it sets up some compounding of the column names in order to group these. And since you know, timestamp appears first, uh, all of these groupings will be pr you know, prefixed by a timestamp, and it means that all of them will be sorted first by timestamp. Um, so what that means is if we select from samples or resources some resource, right at that point, that automatically indicates that everything that follows, all the predicates that follow, will be with, from within this single row. Um, we can simply find the records, and, and in as much as possible, they'll be contiguous on disk. Uh, we can simply find those and construct a tabular result set, just exactly what we would get if we were using join tables in a relational database. This is the results you get from Cassandra. You would get a tabular result that contains uh, the group of, of metrics and values for a given timestamp. Uh, it works the same way for a range of timestamps. It's you know, more interesting. Uh, you know, where timestamp is greater than or equal to T1 and less than or equal to T3, uh, the important part here is to know that, that this would result in, you know, in a range of columns that, again, in as much as possible, are stored contiguously on disk, and so as much as possible will result in a sequential read of the data. Okay, so uh, Cassandra makes a really good time series database. Uh, you could pretty much pick it up and use it just like it is, but as these things usually go, there's, there's also plenty of room for abstractions for this particular use case. So what we've done is we've, uh, we've started a project called Newts to implement the features uh, that, I, that I talked about, the late or disconnected aggregation and the grouping. Um, and since we think that, uh, that our use case for time series storage is, you know, there's nothing unique to us, that it would be generally useful to others, we've made this a separate project and it's, it's a standalone uh, data store that you, you could use in your own projects. Um, we do raw sample storage and retrieval. Uh, no processing is done on your, on your, on your samples. Uh, no, no, proce no, no processing is automatically done. And you can retrieve the samples exactly as you stored them in. Um, you can, however, perform a query that will result in aggregations and give you sort of graph-ready results. Um, and those aggregations will include, uh, because again, we're storing raw results, that includes like counter values. Uh, you know, the, the actual value of the register are stored raw. Uh, so these aggregations can calculate rate from counters. Um, you can apply aggregate functions, including ones that you write yourself, and you can perform arbitrary calculations and even calculations on calculations to scale them or, or, or aggregate them, you know, multiple aggregates into a single, single value. So it's pretty flexible. And all of this runs at Cassandra speed, which is pretty rip and fast. 
Um, I was doing some tests right before, we, before I came to the conference on uh, Rackspace instances performance 215s, which is 15 gigs of memory and four virtual CPUs. And I pretty reliably got about uh, just about 15,000 samples per second ingest rate per core. Uh, so, you know, 15,000 times four or 15,000 times eight, depending, you know, however many, however many cores you have. And that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty fast, I think. Um, Newt's has a Java API, so you could embed it directly in your project if it's Java. There's also a REST endpoint. It's uh, open source, Apache licensed, uh, caffeine free, sustainably grown, uh, all those buzzwords. This is buzzwords, right? Uh, and yeah, it's up on GitHub. We would love to see contributions. Uh, I would say it's in sort of a uh, you know, maybe late alpha, early beta stage. The software actually works pretty good, but in, in the grand tradition of, of, uh, of open source software, there's definitely a few usability nits and absolutely no documentation. <laughs> so, uh, we haven't really gotten to the point where we consider a first release yet, so I can, I can hand wave that away and say, you know, uh, it'll all be all good at the time, you know, when the time comes. Um, but certainly anybody with, you know, who's slightly initiated, I'm sure could make, could make good use of it. Um, and I will promise everybody here that uh, I will make, I will make, uh, I will clear my plate if you want to use it and you have any issues or you'd like to check it out and need explanations or something like that. So uh, check it out. That's all I have, and I guess we have five minutes left, so if there's any questions, I think we've got plenty of time for it. We have one down here. Um, yeah, first of all, what's the relation to Kairos DB? So, um, Kairos DB is also Cassandra-based time series store. So, um, not having documentation, sorry. Yeah, just the comparison to Kairos DB. Um, okay. From your point of view. Uh, so, grouping would be the big one. Kairos doesn't do any grouping, so in the, in the cases I mentioned where we, where we collect two to 12 metrics at a time, which is very common, that would be two to 12 separate queries. You, you can group on tags. I'm sorry? Like Kairos DB has tags, and you can group on them, as far as I know. Uh, you, yeah, it has tags so that, you could, so that you could identify or mark a group of groups, but if they're still stored in separate rows, right? So it's, um, so it's still, still require, to retrieving them would still require you know, that many queries, that many individual queries. It went here at the back. Oh, oh sorry. I didn't well, I got a really similar question. Okay. How does it compare to graphite to carbon storage? To graphite what storage? The carbon storage. Oh. Yeah, yeah it's in integrated with graphite. Uh, I don't know. That's, 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 that's not a distributed storage, is it? That was probably the big difference. It's, it's, so it's more like RRD tools. Yeah, I, I are we talking about WhisperDB? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think that's, I think that's like RRD without the ordering constraints that you can store out of order data. I think otherwise it's pretty similar to RRD. Thank you. Hi, could you go back to the data molding slide with your CQL, please? Which, which CQL, the DDL part? This one, yes. Okay. Uh, did you say that your, uh, the resource here is the Roki? Yeah, the resource here is what we uh, traditionally call the Roki, the, the partition key. So does that mean that all of your uh, events for a particular resource end up on the same row? Yes. What happens, I mean, the row has, has limits. What happens when right. you spill over? That's a good question. So. Uh, we assume most people will probably use TTL columns, so that's, that's one thing that they would expire. Uh, this is not the case right now, but we're planning to partition, this is probably one of the first things I'll do after leaving here, is partition that, that row key by some time element, probably, uh, you know, probably a week or something, so that uh, in that case, each row will not grow beyond whatever, whatever you collect and store in a week's period of time, okay. which, uh, which is pretty reasonable. For, uh, I work at Spotify, we're fairly heavy Cassandra users, and we've, we've had a couple of cases where you sort of store, endlessly store things to one single row, and even if you delete things, uh, they don't disappear in Cassandra because you end up with tombstones, so, so the, uh, effectively your performance for that particular row goes down further and further. 
Um, so you need you will need to partition like you yes like you state. Uh, a follow up question: Does that mean that if you have very heavy traffic on one particular resource, then you create do you create hotspots in there? Uh, cluster. Maybe that's not a. I don't. I don't anticipate that that would actually be a problem. I mean, that, 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 that you would have such high sample frequently or frequency or so many metrics that would probably indicate a, a modeling problem. This this does kind of put the onus on the user to kind of you know to establish what those groups are. You could you can always just store one value per, which is the way a lot of time series time series databases do it, where you know it's essentially a key and a value, and the resource would be the, the key, and you know you'd have one value. So the grouping is kind of a feature, and it's, it's incumbent upon the user to decide what makes sense for a group. So I think for that to happen, you'd have to have a, uh, you know, a group that, that didn't make sense, a group that was too large. There's, there's one back here. Hi. Uh, why is uh, consistency so important for you? Because basically you're aggregating data, which means in my book that if you lose like a, a few metrics, it's not going to hugely affect your, your aggregates, right? Um, yeah, we probably don't have really, really strong consistency guarantees. Um, that, that doesn't mean that we don't want to, to replicate and that we don't want, you know, that we don't want to store, you know, to have a replica count greater than one. Um, particularly because, again, you know, so, so I guess to answer your question, we want availability more than anything. Right. Um, and so having multiple, you know, replicas gives us redundancy. And, you know, yeah, we may use a consistency level of one. That'll actually be a choice. That's actually a choice through newts uh, that you can choose your consistency. For us, I think that, you know, in most use cases for this, it would just be one, which just means that it's even, even more available. Yeah. You know, the availability is even higher. Okay, thanks. A uh, follow-up question, so how does this compare to, say, a uh, Logstash Elasticsearch uh, setup? So we're running that in production. I'm sorry, how does it, how does it compare to what? Uh, Logstash and Elasticsearch. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. <coughs> uh, anyone else? That one down here? Hi, so is the grouping of the metrics that you do only for um, different metrics on the same resource? Um, you, don't, you don't support any grouping for um, metrics on different resources? Uh, no, I think I would probably consider that like an indexing problem, probably. Uh, yeah, this, this is assuming that you want, to, you want to, to query, this data model assumes and Newt's assumes that you want to query a group of metrics by a resource. Not necessarily, you know, you know a group a group of metrics across the set of resources, it would be a different problem, I guess, and one that this doesn't address. Uh, a follow-up question. So uh, if you store a single wide row for a resource, and if you have a large number of metrics for that one resource, um, could that not cause some performance issues? Uh, I, think that's, I think that's similar to the question at the back. And, and the answer would be, I think if you've grouped correctly, you know, you're probably, you know, the, the, a good sized group is probably anywhere from two metrics to you know maybe a dozen or maybe even two dozen. I think that before you would actually push the the, the row constraint, you know, push the, the width of the row to the point where you caused performance, uh, I think your sample sample frequency would have to be very. I don't have to do the math to be to give you examples, but I think the sample frequency would have to be very very high and the metric group very very large before that became an issue. Again, we're going to partition the row keys so that. Uh, at most, uh, you know, I think week is probably what would what be partitioned on. And so at most, a week's worth of data would be in a given row. So would you break up um, a resource with lots of metrics down into smaller resources? Uh, yeah, correct. Okay. Thanks. So to, to achieve high throughput, is there anything on the network layer that you're doing special? Like what does the transport look like up until... Uh, well, the four core test at uh, the four core test I was doing, where where I was getting about fifteen thousand samples per second per core, you know, sixty thousand requests or so, uh, that was only generating about sixty megs, sixty megabit of traffic. So, you know, a hundred meg link would do for that. So nothing so, special. Yeah. 
Same, same sort of capacity planning that would apply to anything else, I think. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you.